Our main speaker today is so special, he actually gets two introductions. <laughs> Uh, before I bring Mark Wright to the program to introduce him, I want to say that I've had the pleasure of sitting next to Dr. Jokey and to next to Al Hutchinson. Al calls himself Dr. Jokey's driver. Um, he is a 40-year Rotarian and Paul Harris Fellow, and he says Dr. Jokey's true claim to fame is that he was in Al's Boy Scout troop and that he married uh, Dr. Jokey's sister. Come on up. <laughs> Come on up, Mark Wright. Thank you, Thank you President Kim. Uh, good afternoon, fellow Rotarians. Um, earlier this summer, I had a chance to meet Dr. James Jokey. Um, we did a documentary on the Apollo anniversary um, and the Museum of Flight. Did anybody get down to the Museum of Flight and get to see the capsule and the lunar module? Oh, yeah. Um, so the more I got to know about Dr. Jokey, the more impressed I was. And after putting the story together, I thought, wow, we should have this guy come and talk to our Rotary Club. I don't know what you were doing when you were 26 years old, but let me take you back 50 years ago, July, when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were walking on the moon. This guy, 26 years old, was at the controls. And he was responsible for their life support systems as they walked on the moon at 26 years old. His person, <laughs> I couldn't find my shoes when I was 26 <laughs> years old. This guy, as you learn more about him today, Dr. Jokey, um, he fell in love with space and just lived, ate, and breathed everything about space and started working after graduating from the University of Washington at NASA and just jumped right in. So he helped design and test the life support systems that the astronauts used, including the spacesuits and the life support packs. And the more that we've talked together, it really is, when you think about what it takes to, to keep someone alive somewhere away from Earth, it's really a combination of medical knowledge, knowledge of physics, and knowledge of chemistry. It's a very complex uh, scenario, and this guy figured it all out at a very young age. So um, Dr. Jokey transitioned after NASA, and I think this is one of the more interesting aspects of who this guy is. So after he did all that, which I would have called it a career after that, he transitioned from engineering to medicine. Got a master's degree in physiology, then eight years of med school, residency, became a medical doctor. As an OBGYN here in this area, he practiced for 40 years, and he delivered 6,000 babies. <laughs> so he... <laughs> and so... It's pretty safe to say he can't go anywhere in the community without someone coming up to him and saying, hey, thank you, I love you. Um, I just want to talk just a couple of sentences about the Apollo program. Um, 400,000 people in America worked on the Apollo program in terms of the projects and the engineering and the equipment and the testing and the building of all of the Apollo uh, vehicles and spacecraft. 20,000 different companies were involved and the Boeing company coordinated all of the construction and the effort. Um, so it was a massive effort and it was a major win in terms of the Cold War and who we are as a nation. This guy was front and center and I hope that you enjoy his presentation. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Jim Jokey. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you for inviting me. By the way, can you hear me? Is this thing working? Yeah. All right. Uh, that's quite. Wait a minute. In Mission Control, when we get ready to launch, we lock the doors. We have no early goers. I see two people leaving on my presentation. What's the deal? Yeah. Yeah, oh, man. Well, I am a flight controller. It takes about four years to become a, a flight controller. You've all seen the movie Apollo 13, and that's Mission Control. And my, during my time uh, at, at four years working up was this. This is called an EMU, the Extra Vehicular Mobility Unit. Extra vehicular outside the spacecraft, mobility, they're supposed to walk in these things, unit. So it's a self-supporting spacecraft. I'll pass that around there. All right. And we did it all with high-speed computers. <laughs> And when I go to the classes and I discuss it with kids, because they, they always ask, where do you plug it in? <laughs> yeah. And I didn't bring my white shirt and narrow tie, but I should have. 
but I brought my glasses. Does this look familiar for the flight controllers? Do you remember those pictures? Yeah. But, you know, he didn't want to look too geeky, so we got the small one, you know, an affordable <laughs> unit. So, anyway, as an uh, engineer, a brand new engineer, as I said, at 26, it was my turn to be on console. Uh, and it was really remarkable. First of all, I need to say, how many member people here remember July 20th, 1969? All right. So I want to remind you, this is not the labor and delivery class. That's okay, you got that? <laughs> all right. So, review. For those who don't remember, okay, on the 16th of July, it's like this, we launched into Saturn V, 7.6 thousand pounds thrust, million pounds thrust, and they're in orbit around the Earth, and then they do what's called a translunar injection, up to 25,000 miles an hour, faster than a speeding bullet, and on the way to the moon, they're rotating the vehicle, so because of hot and cold, it's called a, uh, a thermal soak heat, I think they call it uh, something about haircuts. Anyway, on the way to the moon, halfway to the moon, it gets into the lunar influence, and once it gets there, uh, they, by that time they've turned around and extracted a lunar module, and on the back side of the moon, that little engine there, SPS, slows them down. Now they're captured in the lunar orbit. Same thing happened on Apollo 8. Who remembers Apollo 8? Remember they read from Genesis on Christmas Day? Yeah, so Apollo 8, they only had a command center. This buggy wasn't ready. So then Neil and Buzz, got to remember this was in stages. First we had to figure out this vehicle works, then this vehicle works, and we practiced on Apollo 10. And Apollo 11 was the first time <clears throat> everything was ready to go, including my hardware. Pretty exciting time. So they went in the backside of the moon, fired, it slowed down. Neil and Buzz got into the lunar module, and this is just keep circling for <laughs> at 60 miles around. All right? That's good. Yeah. Don't break it, it's plastic. The good ones are at home. So Neil and Buzz <clears throat> got into their vehicle and they fired again on the back side of the moon, which brought them down within 50,000 feet. And the descent engine was then fired, and it's eight to ten minutes of, I won't say pure hell, but I'm not in mission control at this time. The mission was divided up in phases. You had the descent phase, the lunar phase, and the ascent phase. So nobody else is in there. The doors are locked. They only have the flight controllers working on the console at the time. The rest of us are in what they call the peripheral staff support rooms, you know, listening, because I knew if Neil landed, well, we knew he was going to land, at, that he was going to move the EVA up, the, ex, the, the lunar walk. So we were all kind of hanging out and waiting. So it was, uh, you guys all know the, the story. He rolled over, looked down as he's coming down, and says, <clears throat> we're, long, we're landing long, and he did and ended up into a boulder field. And uh, there are, you listen to three loops as a flight controller. The internal loop, the flight director loop, and the air to ground loop. So you had voice discipline once you're listening. Every time the crew would talk, everybody shuts up to hear, what are they saying? Meanwhile, the flight director is asking a specific question. He's asking the guy responsible for the propulsion, how are we doing on fuel? He says, let me know at one minute and 30 seconds. So here's Neil coming down. Shh about 50 feet, and if you listen to the tapes, you'll hear uh, the lunar module pilot, which is Aldrin, is just looking at the computer. And by the way, going down, we had the 1201 and all that stuff, but they got down there anyway. Anyway, so he's saying down two feet per, per second, going to the right, and, and then uh, you hear the uh, GNC guy say to the flight, uh, 60 seconds. And so then the capsule communicator, another astronaut, calls up and says, and the delay is about 1.2 seconds because they're 240,000 miles away. 60 seconds, and everybody's looking at the data, and it says, what, is, what do you think, is a helicopter or something? He's hovering, but he's moving away from the boulders. And then, next thing you hear the control guy say, flight, 30 seconds. We're talking about how much fuel's left. And uh, so they call that up, and we're looking, and, 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 and on the legs on the lunar module, are, there are some uh, extensions. They're, uh, this kills me, in meters. Once you get to the moon, it goes to a metric system. I never understood that. <laughs> but we're all in your system. It's all feet per second. You get on the moon. So anyway, they stick down one meter, whatever that is, three feet, whatever, on all the pegs. So they were afraid that the descent engine would just blow the dust away, and there they disappear. So the idea is when they touch, there's a light that comes on right in front of both of them, a big green light, lunar contact. 
So then that means he shuts down the engines and would fall the distance, whatever it is, a foot or two at one sixth gravity. And uh, so if you listen to that, you'll hear him say, uh, Aldrin will say, lunar contact, and then you hear Neil say, engine locks, uh, shut down, so forth. So everybody in mission control knew they were there. Moment of silence, someone, are they gonna tell us anything? You know, tranquility base, we have landed. All right, then the best part of the mission comes. Uh, Neil says, uh, by the way, this is the battery that goes in my backpack. You got two hands? That's heavy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anyway, uh, that's, a, that's what we put in the back. Everything weighed a lot. Uh, so he moved up, and uh, then my job was to, to open the, the big doors, the green doors, and that, that sort of hit me. We've been practicing, practice, simulation. You'd fail this, and you, what do you do? If you fail this, you do it. We did well on Apollo 9. And then I remember walking through the doors and saying, this is the real thing. <laughs> and I'm going to be sitting on the console, and these two guys, as they're putting their stuff on, I'm going to be responsible for their life. Everybody else is watching the TV screen. I've got my eyeballs on the data to make sure that they're not consuming their water too fast and all that. And then they get back in, and the guy who was next to me was learning about the system, about twice my size, gave me a slap and knocked me right out of the chair <laughs> and said, we did it, you know, and then we're sort of still sitting there, we're in the daze, and then it was time for us to leave the control room. And now that the, the uh, ascent team comes in, uh, and there's a, then they've got all the risks. Are we going to be able to uh, guillotine all the controls, okay, and launch properly, because this is left on the surface, the moon. We'll come up and rendezvous, where, where is that thing? Okay, we rendezvous, and they transfer the rocks and this is jettisoned, and it lands on the moon. It crashes. And, there's a pr and then, meanwhile, on the moon, we have several of these. First test question I have for you, how many of these are left on the moon? Don't answer yet. I'll let you think about it, OK? Because the people always say, we never went to the moon. Well, we had a satellite go around, and it's photographed all of these and the flags on the moon. So, so then, after they transfer everything, they fire the engine. This has to work again to break the gravity pull from the lunar module correction, from the moon, and then about three days, and it's doing its rotation, and then if it gets close to Earth orbit, this is the only part that returns. It comes in at uh, 3,500 degrees, temperature at 25,000 miles an hour, faster than a bullet, and then about uh, 10,000, they pop the parachutes and then land. There's two ways you can land. You can land this way in the water, or you can land this way in the water. <laughs> On Apollo 11, they landed this way. So they have these guys strapped to their couches, sitting upside down in the waves doing this. Their stomach is not doing very well, but they have some special inflatable balloons, and when it does, it rotates it back up. So they said that was the hardest part in the whole mission, is not throwing up when they landed in the water. <laughs> All right. So on uh, my first mission, which was Apollo 9, that was everything, including the Saturn V and everything, is in Earth orbit. That's where they did the whole mission in Earth orbit. And then the only thing that came back, I got some uh, charcoal from uh, one of the filters. Uh, the ones like in Apollo 13, they couldn't have enough filters. I got one there. So when they're through with the mission, what do they do with my backpacks? The second question. Anybody have an idea? Say it out loud. They're on the moon. My beautiful backpacks are on the moon to bring back some stupid rocks. All right. Anyway, so that's the second question. How many successful launches did we make it to the moon? Number two, how many people landed on the moon? And number three, how many backpacks? We'll be thinking about that. All right. We're going to, uh-oh, they didn't start this already. Hey, guys, we don't want to start this. Go back. Go back. Go back. Yeah, Houston, we have a problem, technically. Yeah, go, go back to the beginning. I'll tell you when to start it. All right. All right. Okay, well, if that's close to the beginning. Let it go at that time. All right, so here's a question. As a flight controller, I decided I'm going to do everything the astronauts do so I know everything there is about that backpack. I'm going to go into centrifuge. I'm going to go uh, zero G. We'll demonstrate how we do that. I'm going to be going in hard vacuums to figure it out. Okay, here's the number one question. How are we going to demonstrate zero G? How? Okay, say it louder. Uh, I don't know the exact term, but it's a very fast plane that like, 
Basically the vomit, vomit comet. The vomit comet. All right. Okay. And that's what this is. I think we're almost in a vomit. Can you stop it? Okay. In the vomit comet, now I can explain what we're doing. Good. In the vomit comet, it's a good old 707, and it takes a command module mock-up, and they put the three test subjects, I repeat, test subjects in there, because these are really stupid people. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> And you take this airplane, you go from 26,000 up to 35,000, and then you dive down to 26,000, and then you go back up to 35. You do that 70 times. Your stomach is here, then it's here. You don't eat breakfast unless you want to share it. And uh, so you have 40 seconds of zero G. That's everybody, the cameraman, the test subjects, the pilots. And then when it pulls out, Two and a half Gs. That's everybody in the airplane is thrown down to the thing. All right, so here's our problem. The Russians just lost some cosmonauts, not too prior to this, where they were in what's called church leave environment. You know, like you see what air, uh, uh, jet pilots fly. They had a uh, rapid decompression in their reentry module. It killed them all, hypo hypoxia. So NASA said, well, these guys are going to be in these things for three and a half days. They're not going to like it. Let's do this. Let's have them have the suits on, but the gloves are off and the helmet's off. So in an emergency, they just put that on. And the third guy, which will rotate, will be in a uh, soft suit configuration. All right? So how, we assume that we got a hole in the vehicle. We need to get them all suited up and pressurized because there's a leak. Now, how big is that leak? Engineers work it backwards. How long did it take to get in the suit? Then you work it backwards and said, the hole is only this big. That's funny. You guys didn't like it. OK. <laughs> All right, OK, are we running? OK. Everybody asks, what do you do? How far did we get? Can we back it up from the beginning? All right, first question is, all the astronauts are wearing, if they're not going on outside, they're wearing a uh, good old J.C. Panay J.C. Panay underwear. This, now, this is zero G in a vomit comet. So when the lights die, go down. OK, now the next question is, how do you do things in space like urination? All right, well, we have a urine collection device. And you're going to see that in a minute. Uh, engineers aren't very smart. What color should the urine collection device be? Yellow. Very good. <laughs> it's coming out here in a minute. OK, you got to remember, this is in a command module floating. 40 seconds and you stop. 40 seconds and you stop. So there'll be breaks in the film. OK? All right, and that's a wonderful cotton from J.C. Panay, uh, right off the shelf. Now, the hard part is it's a condom special that you wear, and it was small, medium, and large. The astronauts say, that ain't going to work. You got to have gigantic, mag, you know, whatever. <laughs> so they change it. So here's the urine collection device. And what color is it? I guess it'd be yellow. Yeah, all right, that allows you to relieve yourself inside the suit. Many times I thought going to a football game, wouldn't we need to have one of those puppies? You could drink all the beer you wanted. All right, all right, so we're putting on ear and collection, and the suit weighs about 40 pounds. The whole EMU that we're passing around, that weighs 180 pounds. It's heavier than the astronauts. But in 0G or 16G, it's not so much the weight, it's the mass. And I have a funny story about that. I'm a system Boy Scout leader, and I've been wearing my pack here about six months ago, and I was taking out the garbage can. I rolled it out forward, and I forgot that I had my backpack on, and it, it just came on top of me, and I was sitting there laughing. I said, I should call the neighbors, but they'll probably call 911. So I just pushed it back up. But it's the same thing is that the mass, and you'll see them, and uh, you look at some of the EVAs on the lunar surface where they fall down, and they do one of those one-hand push-ups because one six G. All right, so now we're putting the suits on, I think. OK, the light's turning dark. It means two and a half Gs. All right, now this is the suit. And the reason the suit is white is that's a thermal garment for when you're on the lunar surface. That's 26 layers, because it has to withstand minus 250 from the back when you're wasting away from the sun, and a plus 250 facing the sun. Remember, there's no atmosphere, so none of that heat's dissipated. So, they have a liquid cooling garment underneath that is a bunch of tubes running up and down, and it's hooked to the backpack, and you can turn it to a minimum, intermediate, or maximum. You can cool their bodies down with 48-degree water running up and down, 
and that's really a chill. Arm, Aldrin was the only one that did it for about two seconds. Says, I don't like it, but <laughs> all right, it's too cold. So what are we doing? We're still putting the suit on. All right, now you're going to get a better idea where everybody is. Okay, this is a command module, and you're going to see the other two subjects to the right and left. To the right and left, and the subjects of importance in the one in the white suit is trying to get his suit on because we have an emergency uh, decompression for a hole. We haven't decided how big the hole is yet because you got to work how long it'll take and you work it backwards. Right. All right. Now you see there's double zippers on the suit. One is a pressure zipper because you want your suit to maintain pressure, and the other second zipper is a restraint zipper so they don't come apart. Now, if you don't cover that zipper up and you're facing the sun or away from the sun, guess what your back will feel? Hot or cold. So they have what's called a beaver tail. It comes around and catches in the front. Okay, now this is all done in zero G parabolas, all right? And this is the couches, one, two, and three. They're flat, and if you go to the museum flight when they bring out uh, their boiler uh, command module, not the one that was here from Columbia, you'll see the three couches. They're really fancy. It's, I think it's made out of leftover something, who knows? <laughs> but they're not very, it's, it's just the material. So you can see the zippers, we're gonna cover it, and you need someone helping you to close the zippers. Okay, to make sure the crotch is closed, very important. <laughs> All right, now, and, and, and what it is, it's a block and tackle system. So we have to hook up the block and tackle up here so you can move it, because you're in a pressurized system and they have convolutes so you can move your arms and your legs, that sort of thing. Now, the only person who could figure that out was international latex. Okay, what are they important for, ladies? What? The living bra. So they're the ones that figured out this suit. Okay, now we're putting out the cables. You see the hook table. So now we can pressurize the suit and be able to move our arms. So how are we doing on time? Anybody got the time? Not your time. I'm talking about the time in the hole in the spacecraft. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't timing it? I thought you were the sergeant at arms. My goodness. All right. Okay, okay. All right, so we're, gonna, we're hooking up all the communication cables and all that. We are doing okay in time, right? I thought so, yeah. I've done this before. All right, and the hoses. And you can see when they're lying on their back, these are all the controls that are above their heads that they would manipulate when they're going out into space. Okay. So now we're going to be pressurizing all three of these volunteers shortly. And that's, uh, oh, here we got a gentleman right here. And if you take a look, uh, this is the first time that he had tried this. He, he, he didn't put his hoses in exactly straight. He's got them twisted three times. And you're going to learn something about torque. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah, so. As I would say, if he was pregnant, you're laying on the wrong side. You're supposed to stay on the left side, but, you know, he's not. So what do I say? <laughs> but you can see what a nice help he is with everybody else. Okay, and that's the couch. He's putting back together. Meanwhile, the gentleman on the right is putting on the gloves, putting on the helmets, and he's trying to stay out of everybody's way, I think. I'm not sure. All right, are we timing it still? Uh, 22 seconds. <laughs> 22 seconds. <laughs> That's fast. Okay. So, uh, and again, you watch the, light, the lights will dim. And when they dim, that means you better be lying down or sitting down because the airplane's going to throw you to the bottom of the airplane. You got to remember everybody, the cameraman, this is all done with 16 millimeter film. This was done in like 1966, I think, 67. It went from uh, 16 millimeter film to VCR, VCR to a DVD, DVD to a thumb drive. Now it's on my computer. That shows the technology, right? All right, so now he's, he's wrestling with a boa constrictor. He's got it kind of wrapped all around him. Yeah, yeah and uh, he's still trying to figure out, and you don't realize this is happening until after you process the 16 millimeter film, and then you debrief and say, this is really interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is why you have test subjects do this first and let them figure out 
I'll just screw up. And then the backup crew does it. And then by the time the primary crew does it, it's a piece of cake. Yeah. So let's see. He's still trying to get comfortable, bouncing around. Let's see. I think I can position myself by putting my foot against something or other. I hope it's not important. <laughs> All right. So here's what it's like. Zero G. Ta -da, ta -da, ta. Ta -da, ta -da. Bonk. I hope that wasn't important. <laughs> <laughs> sort of like the Macy Parade blimps. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, oh, we're doing it from the sideline. He's helping here now. He's coming out to help. Let's see. What can I do? Let me step on your communication thing. Maybe see if. <laughs> see if let me see. <laughs> Oh, that didn't work, I guess. All right. All right, so trying to trade places. All right, so it's going to move back up to the right couch, and he's going to go to the center couch. If he doesn't strangle himself. Now, the suits are exactly the same. These don't have the white garment. That's the thermal garment. But the, under the white garment would be a blue pressure suit like that. So he, he's still trying to get positioned in his couch. <laughs> and uh, it sort of looks like a turtle on its back. Yeah. These are the uh, straps that are supposed to go around his waist. And that is the foot rest that's supposed to come up. Hmm. Well, let's see. We can figure this out. Uh, not quite doing it. Well, let me go down and uh, we can. Oh, let me disconnect my comm cable. <laughs> All right. So let's see. All right. Now let's don't. Uh, Let's see if we can figure out how to fix that, that couch. <laughs> and these, again, are the straps. The straps. Seat belts. Let's see. That's probably not in the right place. Let me think about that. So why he's doing that in a suit that could be on the way to the moon, that's going to be seven days. What sort of other vital functions do we need? <laughs> Anybody have any suggestions? <laughs> Food is one I was thinking at the other end. Well, all those who have had children with pampers, that's NASA invented it. So every astronaut that goes out is wearing a pamper. And then they have the urine collection devices. But if you ask any astronaut, did you ever use your pamper? <laughs> Not me. But, but I wondered on Gemini 7 when Borman and Lovell were in a Gemini vehicle for 14 days. I said, boy, and that is a tight vehicle. I, I'm not sure what they did, but we don't want to ask that question. Anyway, so he's still trying to figure this out. So we mentioned food. How are we going to feed somebody in a pressure suit? Anybody? But where? How are you going to get them into the suit? Well, hey, if you're engineers and you're going to be a flight controller, you better have an answer. Anybody? What? A what? No, we, but we put a feed port in. A feed port. Now. Where are you going to put the feed port? Oh, here's the water gun. This is important. Right side, left side, or center? Where do you want that feed port? Quickly, can I make a decision? Center. Can't. Can't see where you're landing. Right side or left side? Right side, except the engineer was left handed. It's on the left side. OK, this is a water gun. And if you look at the water gun, it has a little uh, poppet. It goes out, comes in, and gives five cc's of water. Why doctors needed to know that? Can't you ask them if you're thirsty? All right. so. First, we've got to stick it in which ear? Yes. That's right. Should be a simple project. We'll just stick it in the left ear. <laughs> Can you guys see it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Stick it in the left ear. Yeah. Don't die of dehydration trying to get it in there. All right. Uh, uh. <laughs> and there's the trigger is right here. You pull that trigger, that shuttlecock goes out and comes in. You better keep things away from that. 
That is stuck to his tongue. And the trigger is out here, which you can't see or feel. So everybody say that. Grab your tongue. I'm stuck to my tongue. And meanwhile, what did he say? He, you know, it's stuck to the tongue. <laughs> How much time? That's it? For the first go around? Okay. Okay, well, we, uh, okay, we're, we're almost done. Honest done. Okay, I'm almost done. Okay, boy, this guy's tough. Okay, we're close to the end. All right, it's going to show the next important thing is, everybody's heard of Tang, right? Okay, this is the uh, astronaut's fluid. Okay, the next thing we're going to demonstrate, Tang. As soon as, uh, uh, we're going to get it out right now. Why don't we go to the second one? If I only got five minutes, want to go to the second one, please? Number two, the second one. We'll bypass that. Anyway, uh, here we go. The water gun. Uh, there. I think that's just a close-up of sticking it back on the thing. Can you move it forward? How much time? Thir two seconds. Yeah. You have to. Okay. Okay. I can still have time. You got 11 minutes total. 11. I can do it in 11 minutes. Oh, easy. All right. <laughs> This just shows a close-up. By the way, I still have that scar. That's me. Yeah. Hey, want my signed autograph? <laughs> that was 1966. I look the same, though. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then over here are more recent ones, delivering babies. Yeah. Anyway, so I'm hoping that we could advance it to the tang. Can you move it up to the tang? Because it's, it's also funny, very funny. A little bit more. Okay, here we go, that's the tang. We're gonna, okay, everything we send in space is dehydrated because they make water and water's heavy. So you, don't, you want everything dehydrated. So we're gonna reconstitute the tang in a little bag, like going on a Boy Scout outing, and stick it where? Your left ear, right. Sound like a simple project? But there is a little problem. All right, okay, this it looks like it's going in a lot easier if I could find the opening. All right. Oh, we forgot something. The suit is pressurized. Think about the container. Look at the, the interface down here. <laughs> this is why you send the test subject first to find out. Yeah, there's tang everywhere, but going into my mouth. Yeah. Uh, uh. All right, so here comes the fix. All right, that's it on the video. All right, all right. Okay. So, I'm, I'm not through. Hey, hold it, hold it, hold it. I'm not done. Stop it. You're taking my time. I want 30 more seconds. All right. Okay, so how many successful launches do we have? Where's my jacket? Put it on. Oh, wow. No, we need you. Come on around. Okay, I'm coming. Okay. How many, how many successful on the moon? Six. Okay, how many people walked on the moon? Okay, how many of my backpacks are on the moon? Yeah, we got a special deal today. We'll give them for you almost nothing, but we don't deliver. All right, come on over here. All right, so turn around, your best side. Okay, best side. that's the best side. Apollo 1, we lost the astronauts on that one because we were go fever, the spacecraft wasn't ready. Apollo 7, we came back and demonstrated a new spacecraft, the command module, 14 days would get us to the moon and back. Apollo 8, the lunar module wasn't ready, so we sent the command module that worked around the moon and they orbited the moon, they took that Earth's uh, Earth rise, sunrise, beautiful picture. They came back. Uh, Apollo 9, everything was ready to go. We did an Earth orbit. Everything worked well. Rusty Swicard, who is wearing my equipment, has motion sickness. Almost every astronaut has that. That's why when they got into shuttle, they did no EVAs for a while. They all took shots. By the way, I did the very first EpiPen shot in a spacesuit. There's a patch here, and it was down at uh, Baylor. 
stuck it in my leg, injected the fluid, and the guy says, I'm not quite ready yet with the x-ray. And I said, any time now? <laughs> and then I pull it. But that's where the EpiPen, they have a special patch. All right, so anyway, so he only was on uh, in my backpack for 33 minutes. But I was 33 minutes on the console. I'm not a rookie. So I went from 33 minutes on 9 to 2 hours and 43 minutes on Apollo 11. A little bit of a jump. OK, Apollo 10, we took the whole vehicle, the whole thing, flew down within 50,000 feet full of side, and everybody said, well, why don't you let them land? The only problem is, and this is, again, NASA is really funny. We don't have enough fuel. Which one would you like to reduce the fuel on, the descent stage going down or the ascent stage coming up? <laughs> they did it to the ascent stage. I couldn't figure that one out. Oh, those managers, you don't trust them. Anyway, then Apollo 11, I mean, we're all ready to go. We tested everything. We had the best people on board with Neil. He's the best of all of them. He really is. And he's going to, you know, if we got that close, we know he's going to land. He's not going to abort the mission. Then 12, we went back with a couple guys. Where's Apollo 12? OK, then 13, we knew that uh, they blew up the oxygen tank because uh, they were supposed to upgrade the oxygen tank to 58 degree, uh, 15 degree, 58 uh, uh, volts. And it still had the 28 degree system on board. Ground crew used 58 volts, and they burned up all of the uh, electronics inside the tank, the heaters and all that. So when they took the switch, 100% oxygen, blew it out the tank. All right, Apollo 14, that's our, remember who was important on Apollo 14? Alan Shepard. Remember, he got his middle ear fixed, and he landed on the moon. Then Apollo 15, 16, and 17. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, so two more things. How much time? I got three minutes? Five minutes. OK. This is a picture of the time that uh, Neil and them are walking on the moon. And this handsome full soul over here is me in mission control, actually looking at the console, not looking at the pictures. Two more things. I have a Apollo 17 flag that went to the moon over that you should take a look at. So this is my schematic. This is the one I used for Neil Armstrong. So you give the inputs to the draftsman. They put it together. Then I take the data from that manual I have there. It's this thick. Put it on this. And this is slid underneath the plexiglass on the, on the console. So anytime the flight director, you know, and you would call sign. Mine was EMU. So it would say EMU flight. That means he wants to talk to me. Go flight. And he'd ask questions. And you kept your information very distinct, and you didn't talk a lot. It's like the New York subway system. It is. It is. <laughs> anyway, and the thing is, at one time, I knew all this. And, yeah. and then I brought this in. This is from Apollo 15, and I brought it in because it shows you the, how small the lunar module is here. And then here we go. First of all, how far away is this little mound, and how tall? I'm ready for, give me an answer. Shout out. A mile out. How high? Huh? 2,000, 3,000. Uh-uh. It's 14,000 feet, and it's 10 miles away. It's like Mount Rainier. There's no depth perception at all on the moon. That's why when they land, they have the shadow. Some behind them, they can see the shadow as they get closer, so they don't have to trust the computer. All right. Uh, your turn. Questions? How much time for question and answer? Two, four minutes. All right. Yes, ma'am. OK, all the astronauts and all the flight controllers say, we need to keep going. You need another President Kennedy. The problem is, what happens is financing. Congress cut the funds, so we didn't fly 17, 18, or 19. They're over laying around somewhere. On the shuttle program, uh, they're good for 50. Congress cut it at 35. So again, and what happens is that people like myself, except I changed careers, they say, I'm unemployed. They go elsewhere. So you've got to build up that 400,000 people again. International Space Station is going to happen again, 2022 or 24. I think uh, NASA is going to say it's not ours anymore. It's, so we could take a collection. It could be part of your club. <laughs> but, but I think people like uh, Blue Origin and I think uh, SpaceX, low Earth orbit. But as the astronaut said for the last 40 years or 30 years, we need to go back to the moon because it's got ice. And it's going to be an easy way to launch. It's got helium-3. It's got all sorts of stuff. Go from the moon to your next project like Mars. To answer your question, until someone gets steps forward, says we're going to do, we need a better administrator. I wouldn't say that, but we do. And then we need Congress to back it. Otherwise, we watch Indians. They, they just land on the moon. The Chinese land on the moon. Everybody's going to land on the moon and we'll say, thank you. Good job.
All right. So just real quick, uh, thank you so much. I mean, no, I guess that must be it. I'm out, right? <laughs> no, <laughs> 50 years ago, the U.S. accomplished this. And just this past week, India, just trying to put a probe down, couldn't quite do it. So again, hats off to the entire team, and thanks for joining us today. Real quick, what do you think of the Space Force concept? Wrong. That was it, OK? Leave, Na leave NASA by itself. It can do it. We don't need to integrate it. We tried that MOL project. Air Force tried to build theirs, and it said, this is too costly. Leave NASA by itself. Yes. There was a book called Hidden Figures that then became a movie. Yeah. Can you relate your experience with those no, women? That was before my time. That was Mercury. I didn't get into the middle of Gemini. And like I say, I didn't know which way to plug the headset, which goes in the ear and which goes on the console. So I came in, and I was learning how what I needed for Apollo. And that was my job. All right? Anything else? All right. I have a flag. I have a flag that went to the moon on Apollo 17 up here you should all take a look at. Okay? All right. How'd they do in time?